Good afternoon and welcome to today's session of Business as Usual. I'm Audrey Russo, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And along with me today is Jonathan Kirsting. He's our Director of Visibility and he's our co-host. So a few things about today's call. You know, we have a lot of people here and I just want to get through some of the logistics and thanks our sponsors. We have Huntington Bank, who has stepped up to sponsor this daily series. And if you don't know them, they are the largest SBA lender in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And then also thanks to AT&T for their sponsorship and continued support of today's session as well and almost everything they're doing for their customers and their communities as it relates to COVID-19 pandemic. So we've actually highlighted their employee volunteerism, their support for food rescue, their support for um, statewide support for first responders and over 100K to 10 organizations in statewide across Pennsylvania. So as a quick programming note, so today we have a special session of business as usual. And normally these are 30 minutes, but today it will be one hour. So you can leisurely enjoy your lunch. So let me tell you, the first segment we have um, joined by two of Governor Tom Wolf's cabinet secretaries, including Secretary Dennis Davin from the PA Department of Community and Economic Development and Dr. Rachel Levine, who serves as the secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Health. For our second segment, we, which will start around 1230, we will be joined by U.S. Senator Bob Casey and we will talk about $500 billion stimulus package that was adopted this week by Congress. And I'm also pleased to announce that we're being joined on today's call by quite a few members of the Philadelphia Alliance of Capital Technology, which is a counterpart organization of the Eastern side of Pennsylvania. Welcome to all of you. PACT is an important partner for us as we lobby our state and federal officials to support pro-growth environment for tech businesses. So we hope to see you on Monday's call, just to give you a heads up, we're featuring the OSHA administrator, Lauren Sweet. So a little bit about the technology and then we're gonna jump right in. So the technology there's gonna, there is, we put all of you on mute. You're on mute so that we can make sure that you cannot hear anything in the backgrounds. Most of us have things going on. We also want you to know that we will try to make this interactive. There's a chat screen, there's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. This is not a place for you to sell any of your wares. It is a place to ask questions that are relevant to today's speakers. So I really appreciate it. So with that, I am gonna bring on today's guest and I would like to introduce Secretary Levine and Secretary Davin. So welcome and thank you for taking the time. I know you're both extremely busy, so time is precious and your leadership matters to us. So thank you both. So thank, you. thank you very much. So uh, let's jump in. I'm gonna start with Secretary Levine. And you know, we are now in the early days of contemplating a reopening of our economy and as a broader array of Pittsburgh's businesses. So as employers, we wanna do everything possible to protect all of our employees, as, as I know you do. Many of us employ people who are in high risk categories, including those with underlying conditions. How can we help protect those populations from a mental and physical health perspective, is there anything that our employees can do, even if they have one of those underlying conditions to help increase the resiliency to the virus? So you can respond and set the table as you would like. And thank you for joining right. us again. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with my friend and colleague, Secretary Davin. Um, and so in terms of that specific question, I mean, we, in terms of the uh, COVID-19. It, it certainly continues to pose a significant hub of public health threat to the United States and to Pennsylvania. Um, there are uh, continue to be areas of Pennsylvania that are very impacted by COVID-19, particularly in the southeast uh, and in the northeast. Um, other parts of our state have, um, have done very well, um, a lot of it because of less population density. Uh, but Pittsburgh, Allegheny County has done very, very well um, uh, under the directorship of, of uh, Health Commissioner uh, Deborah Bogan, uh, and we have daily conversations with her. So in light of the different aspects of our state, what the governor has decided to do is that we're going to um, start a very slow, phased reopening. Um, and so that'll start on, on uh, May 8th. And then May 8th, um, uh, the, we're going to be looking at 
uh, red zones. Uh, red zones are areas where there still is a lot of, of community transmission of COVID-19. An example would be Philadelphia and the Collar counties. And so they're going to stay red. Uh, and, but there will be some areas that will be able to be yellow zones. And this will be a combination of county data and regional data, um, looking at our, our state health regions um, and, and the six health regions that we have. And so uh, we're going to be getting data about that um, over the course of next week. Uh, and then we'll be making a decision which, which region with which counties could go yellow. And if they're yellow, there could be um, a start to reopening of businesses. So it'll depend upon which region you're in. Uh, if you are in the red zone and in uh, Philadelphia area, you mentioned uh, joining this call, uh, the north, this area of the Northeast, uh, Lehigh County, Luzerne County, um, then the stay at home order continues. The closure of non-essential businesses continues. Um, really everything continues as it was. And so we're hoping that, uh, that employees can telework. Um, and we know that that can be done for some and, and not done for others. So the best thing really in the red zones is for people to stay home. Uh, and to go out only for essential activities such as getting food and, and groceries. Of course, if you run a grocery store, and I, we spoke with uh, the, the, um, the, the grocery store um, industry yesterday, uh, then there are some specific ways that you can try to keep your, your, your staff he uh, healthy, wearing masks, social distancing, and we're, that's why we did the universal mask order, uh, that for the customers and the, the individuals your, your staff would use masks. Uh, for the yellow zone, we still want people to do masks, but there will be an ability uh, for businesses uh, to open. Uh, so for example, uh, restaurants could open for curbside, uh, you know, continue curbside pickup. Other stores could do curbside pickup. Or if you're going to have customers in, there are some specific guidelines uh, for, for that. And so um, I think that those are be kind of the instructions in terms of keeping people safe. Okay, well, thank you for that. We're going to we're jump to Secretary Davin. Thank you for being with us. In the early days of this crisis, DCED acted quickly, even before the federal government, to um, get capital into the hands of small businesses. And just yesterday afternoon, you and Governor Wilf announced a new plan to get funding into the hands of early stage companies. Can you you know, provide the elements of this announcement? Yeah, Audrey, th thanks so much. And again, this is this is really based upon um, discussions that we've had with uh, the technology sector and, and groups, businesses, large, medium, small, uh, uh, you know, newly formed businesses. And uh, for, for a number of uh, weeks now, since, since this has just uh, essentially began, and, and one of the things that we, we, we were really looking to do is to try to fill any gaps that we could. Uh, with the uh, Working Capital Loan Program, uh, we recognize that a lot of businesses, especially kind of our most vulnerable businesses all throughout Pennsylvania, didn't have the luxury of waiting for this, the, uh, the feds to, 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 to apply the SBA uh, program. And, and the program is, it, it's a great program. And, uh, you know, the SBA and, and and uh, uh, Congress has really put a lot of money towards that. We really appreciate that. But we knew that it wasn't going to be for everybody, and especially our most vulnerable populations. So we wanted to be able to get that out, uh, you know, get a program up and running, get it set up, and get money out on the street. And we, we have about, uh, we have a little, uh, right around $25 million that we pushed out on the street right now uh, to about 350 businesses, small businesses. And we're going to continue to do that uh, over the course of the next week uh, before the, uh, the funding is, uh, is essentially uh, depleted. And then we're working for additional, uh, to, to look at additional resources too, to, to replenish that, that fund. While, while we did that, so we also heard from the tech sector. And, and one of the things is that uh, a lot of the uh, early stage companies really don't have uh, access to, to, to just about anything. So um, what we did is we looked at the Ben Franklin Technology Development Authority and the resources that were available there. And to that end, uh, we've uh, worked with our, our Ben's uh, Rich in, uh, in Pittsburgh and, and the other folks uh, have done a great job of saying to us, look, this is, this is a, a terrific need for us right now. We really, we have to have resources to be able to, to utilize for these, these uh, 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 vulnerable tech businesses. So uh, we applied uh, uh, $4 million and we got the approval yesterday uh, through the, the BFTDA and, and are applying $4 million $1 million to, dollars to each of the bends 
and we've asked them to, to uh, match it with a million dollars. So $2 million in each of the areas that they can use for their, their, their vulnerable uh, early stage companies uh, that uh, is really gonna be, gonna be helpful, we think. In addition, we put uh, $10 million out to the venture community because we had that program uh, available too through uh, the BFTDA. And we were asking for the venture community to come to us uh, to make loans to the venture community. If, 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 if a lot of folks on the, on the call know how that works. Uh, but to make loans uh, in the amount of $250,000 all the way up to a million dollars for that $10 million program. So we're looking forward to that. I can tell you that, that uh, the folks in Pittsburgh have really stepped up. Uh, the folks in Philadelphia, uh, you know, as, as Secretary Levine uh, had mentioned, uh, it, you know, they're, they're having a really rough time right now. And I think the folks in Philadelphia uh, really need uh, access to those funds too. And they've done a great job of, of, of coming to us with uh, you know, the requests and the needs for that too. So everybody's done a, done a great job, but uh, we're gonna, we wanna get that out as quickly as we can. One other thing I just wanna say, uh, Audrey, is the fact that when you said uh, uh, for your members that it's not the time to, to sell their products, mm -hmm. I think Secretary Levine will be the first one to say that if the product is, is up and running and, and it helps with, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the things that we need uh, from a PPE perspective, uh, she and I would definitely be uh, interested right. in hearing about that. That's great. And we'll make sure that we have that information. We're going to archive these calls and we'll make sure that we have that information that's available for the point of contact for both of you. So thank you for that. So I'd like to jump back to Secretary Levine. And so you've ramped up, we talked a little bit before about ramping up in terms of uh, data collection and collection of data. Can you talk about the data, why it's so important to your efforts to, to combat COVID, as well as share some insights on what you've learned about the data sets and how have they improved. And finally, can you discuss how that data is influencing the design and your leadership in terms of the reopening? Sure. So um, we've always wanted to have a, a data-driven uh, department and an evidence-based Department of Health. Um, uh, just a year ago, we were actually, uh, there's a new public health accreditation um, uh, board uh, federally, and we received our public health accreditation, and they, you know, emphasize the importance of making uh, decisions based upon data and not upon hunches. Um, so data has always driven things. Um, so uh, we have an established data system that we call NEDS. Uh, we're actually um, in, in the process of updating NEDS, which is quite old. That's how hospitals and health systems report their data to us. Uh, but then there was uh, uh, COVID-19, and so uh, the, the, that update has to be put on hold. So uh, we have hospitals and health systems and, long, and nursing homes, et cetera, that report their, uh, their deaths uh, and their cases to us on a regular basis. In addition, our county municipal health department partners, for instance, the Philadelphia County Health Department, Montgomery County Health Department, uh, Allegheny County Health Department, they all report, uh, the, report that data to us. Uh, and that uh, is the basis by our data reports um, each day. Uh, we have a great set of epidemiologists, uh, sort of um, uh, medical infectious disease uh, investigators that are working night and day to, uh, to collect all of that and, and to put it into, uh, into forms that help drive our decisions. So we have a lot of data coming in, we have numbers coming in, we have lots of different graphs about um, changes of, of cases and deaths over time, um, and then ways to look at hotspots, both um, from a regional point of view, uh, from a uh, county point of view, and then even you know, um, uh, GIS in terms of uh, you know, zip code point of view. So we have done uh, and are really working to be very transparent and put all that data on our data dashboard, which is available at our website at health.pa.gov. We've actually gotten down to the zip code level in terms of, in, in terms of, of, of cases. Um, the challenges we face is that it's an old data system. Um, our data is only as good as, as the reporting that comes to us. So we you know, have to make sure that our hospitals and nursing homes, et cetera, are reporting all the data to us efficiently. Uh, same with the county and unity health departments. Um, so that's always a challenge, collecting all of that data uh, uh, every day. And then working on balancing in public health transparency to the public versus um, privacy and confidentiality for individual uh, patients. We don't want to make, we want to make sure that individual patients that might, or families that might have COVID-19 are not sort of um, 
uh, put forth uh, in, in our data and, and then falling prey to, to social media. So there'll be a, um, a, a number of different models that'll be used. We've been looking at you know, the University of Pittsburgh model and now CHOP Data Center has a model and there's the University of Washington model and there's some other models and we put all that together. Um, uh, Dennis has uh, forged a great relationship and he can tell you about with Carnegie Mellon University that's gonna be putting all that health data in with business data to come up to help us drive. And then we've come up with some metrics, uh, one of which I reported yesterday in terms of uh, um, uh, having less than 50 cases per 100,000 uh, per capita in, in, a, in, a, in a county uh, to help us with a region. But that's just one piece of data. We've gotten a lot of focus because it's really specific. But um, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at that plus the Carnegie Mellon plus many other factors to determine which regions go yellow. That's a lot. Thank you for your, thank you for giving us that. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to Secretary Javin um, a couple of things. First, your team has stood up this manufacturing call to action portal, and I think you alluded to that um, in the previous question that I asked you to help mobilize the PA businesses to produce critical supplies. So you have created a B2B interchange to help Pennsylvania businesses gain access to PPE and critical medical supplies. Can you talk about each of those really quickly and the role that you see them playing throughout this crisis? And we'll surely give people that link as well. Sure, sure, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Audrey. And I think, um, you know, our folks are working uh, uh, day and night uh, and, and with uh, Rachel and her folks at the Department of Health on, on these, uh, these portals. So we, we have actually two portals and a directory. So the one portal is for, um, is for uh, critical medical supplies uh, that uh, uh, people are, are responding to, that, that organizations, companies are responding to, uh, to let us know what, who has supplies and what, not only in the state of Pennsylvania, but out elsewhere. And you guys are, are very familiar with Sherry Collins. Uh, Sherry and uh, Brent Vernon, who runs our Governor's Action Team, and then also um, Denise Brindley, who's our energy uh, 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 executive director uh, that works uh, along with a lot of your companies too. They're actually spearheading uh, these portals and, and putting, they've actually put these together, working directly with these companies, but also it's kind of, it's a coordination effort too, because they have to work with these companies, work with Department of Health to determine what's needed, Department of Health and Pima, and then also work with our Department of General Services to acquire uh, these, uh, these uh, 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 materials. That has worked very well. We've gotten hundreds and, and actually we're up to about 2,000 inquiries uh, through, the, um, uh, through the critical medical supplies portal. The manufacturing call to action portal is the one that we're really uh, interested in too. They're working, the, the three uh, of them along with their teams are working with other departments but with specific manufacturers that might be retooling their processes. Uh, so we've worked uh, uh, with uh, the industrial resource centers, uh, Petra and her group, uh, her group from around the state uh, are working with these manufacturers. They do, they do this as a matter of uh, course of business, but uh, there's a lot of good work that's coming out right now from manufacturers that are changing their processes uh, to, uh, to uh, make PPE and, and uh, from masks uh, there's a there's a company called Fanatics in the in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. They make uh, Major League Baseball uniforms that are uh, now they're now making masks uh, for uh, for general use. Uh, but there are a lot of other companies that are that are doing that too. But also companies that can change their process uh, to make uh, uh, needed PPE that uh, we so desperately need and 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 Secretary Levine calls for all the time. Uh, this is going to be critical too, Audrey, as we continue to. Uh, uh, open up, as Secretary Levine talked about, you know, go from go from the red to the yellow, uh, because um, you know the the interchange directory is going to show uh, does show now if you go onto our website dced.pa.gov, it shows that um, you know th these companies have the, this equipment. So for businesses that are going to be opening up, they're concerned and and rightly so, and so are the employees about having the appropriate amount of PPE. That's going to help them do that. Uh, so we're, we're really working hard, and, and the three folks, Sherry, Brent, and, and Denise, are working, uh, again, night and day uh, with these companies to make sure that they continue to populate that directory uh, so when uh, 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 the Secretary, uh, Secretary Levine and the governor look, and we look to open up different parts of the state, 
there, there's the there's the uh, needed uh, uh, equipment and PPE that's available for use. Okay, so that's great, and we'll we'll put those links out, and we'll make right, sure right. that everyone knows that. So I'm going to jump back to Secretary Levine. Yesterday, we hosted a call with a group of 35 manufacturers, people who actually run these these manufacturing companies. And one of the executives made an interesting point in describing how his company reacted upon reviewing their first disaster plan. And here's what he said, that this is a great plan for a blizzard, but what we really need is a plan for a long winter. And even as we envision it, the, you know, the reopening of our economy, do you predict that we might need to reinstate many of the same restrictions in the future or even new restrictions? So well, as we look for the long haul. Mm -hmm. So we are definitely in it for the long haul. Um, uh, COVID-19 is, is going to be extremely challenging for us. Uh, so we're in the, just in the first phase uh, of that uh, with the closures that, that were instituted, the mitigation method, uh, measures, and then um, you know, now doing a graduated um, uh, you know, uh, reopening. Um, and then we're going to see what COVID-19 does. Um, so there are many pieces of information that we don't know. As we've been discussing, this is a novel, which means new coronavirus, and there's so much we don't know. How will how will it, uh, the, the summer affect it? Um, you know, with influenza, it decreases the uh, the transmission. Will that happen for COVID-19, and how much will that happen? And then one of the things we don't know is how protective antibodies are. Are antibodies fully protective? Are they partially protective? And how long they last? So we don't know any of that in, information. Uh, there have been, uh, a lot, again, lots of different models, lots of different predictions. I like to listen to Dr. Fauci, who says that the model determines, the, the virus determines the timeline. We don't determine the timeline. Uh, but I, I think that we should be prepared uh, for COVID-19 um, until there's a vaccine. Uh, and there might be some temporary vaccines put out even this, in this fall, maybe, but not a definitive vaccine. And so we should be, be prepared for ups and downs and for uh, you know, progress and setbacks probably for the next year and a half or, or more. And it would not be very surprising at all if uh, in the late fall, et cetera, that we start to see more COVID-19. Uh, we'll also be in flu season, so lots of different challenges. It would not be surprising if we have to go back to mitigation um, and some of the closures that we had uh, that we instituted uh, this spring and have to do that again in certain areas uh, later on. But we don't know, but we're going to be making preparations for, uh, for a long winter. As, as a famous TV show said, winter is coming. <laughs> yes, Game of Thrones. So a question from the crowd, we're going to try to ask there are two questions. Um, and I want to aggregate one and then Jonathan, maybe you can get one from I think Karen Feinstein. For the um, Ben Franklin investments, Dennis, and the 1 million match that we've done here, so it's great that we're going to get 2 million, which is fantastic. Is that going to be open to all companies, or is that just part of those that are in the existing portfolio? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And I think, uh, you know, we'd like it to be for more companies that, that are in the, the Ben's portfolio, and we're asking them to, to, to do that. Um, I would encourage you to, to sit down with Rich and, and go over that. Again, we're responding as quickly as we can. We, okay. we hope that this is the first of maybe some additional investments that we can make. But um, uh, I'd encourage you to, to, to sit down and talk to Rich uh, about that. Um, you know, we kind of, they've been requesting this for, for a few weeks now, and, and uh, we wanted to get our, our uh, 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 procedures together and make sure that we could do this and had the funding uh, 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 ready for that. But uh, I, think, um, I think we'll be in a good position to roll this money out quickly for uh, you know, uh, good investments into these companies that really need it right now. So um, uh, we, we've, uh, the answer to the question again is we've asked for them to, to go a little further than just the portfolio companies, but mm -hmm. we wanna make sure that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we can do this uh, uh, quickly. Okay, we still have a lot of questions and we're gonna, we are gonna archive these and get answers to the questions. But running out of time, Jonathan, is there? Do you want to put maybe Karen Feinstein on live? Yeah, let's let's put her on live. Absolutely, she's got a fantastic question here that I think everyone's going to get right. some great value out of. So, Karen, let's spin you up if you're there. Can you ask your question? Um, sure. So, every region obviously wants the best health stats possible, so we can reopen and people can go back to work. 
Um, since 50, in some counties, 70% of the deaths occur in skilled nursing. And because the hospitals would really like to reopen their collective surgery, primary care offices, et cetera, what if whenever there was any indication that there was a positive staff or patient in a nursing home, the hospital sent in a SWAT team right away with um, PPE, other supplies and equipment, maybe personnel, ID expertise, and testing. Um, so that the, it, the disease doesn't spread, we don't have more deaths. Wouldn't that be great for our region's health status? So we do do that. Uh, it's not a it's not a SWAT team that usually uh, physically goes in, uh, but we do have a. Uh, I've been told not to use the term SWAT team because it has other implications. But we do have um, uh, uh, virtual consultations with any nursing homes that have positive cases, and so we have put out guidance, and we're actually revising that guidance. Uh, for all nursing homes and other long-term care living facilities, such as personal care homes, about how to prevent cases and then what to do if there are cases. But then uh, when they have positive cases, we reach out to them and our team will do virtual um, uh, infectious disease consultations. And then we have contracted with a, a company called ECRI uh, to also do those. And so we reach out to all of the, uh, the congregate settings uh, when they have first, uh, when, when they have that. And we have encouraged, we can't make hospitals do that, but I know that for instance, Penn State has, Penn State Health has gone to a local personal care home and is providing some um, specific advice in their area. So we encourage those type of relationships. Uh, we can't require that. And then even in the Montgomery County, I believe it might've been Delaware, uh, the National Guard went in to help, uh, National Guard um, health personnel went in to help a very, very challenged uh, nursing home. So. We do do that, although I've been advised not to use that term. Well, thank you. I think, Jonathan, we have time for probably another question. Absolutely. There's so many great questions here. I know we'll never get to all of them. Um, so let me see here. So uh, this is for Secretary Levine. Um, are you making decisions on easing restrictions only at the regional level or making it county by county? Well, it's going to involve the county data congregated to the regional level. Um, so, but it is good. The decision to go yellow will be a regional decision, not a specific county. So uh, I guess if you are, if your business is in a county that is, um, that has not been very affected, but you are surrounded by counties that have been very affected, um, then it would be unlikely that you would be one of the ones to go yellow. That decision will be, will be regional and we'll be looking at data actually uh, from next week um, uh, to, to do that. But again, there are many different pieces of data uh, that we'll be looking at to all advise um, our, um, you know, the departments, and then finally the governor in his decision. And then how does this impact um, people being able to find childcare at some point in time? Obviously, that's going to correspond with what level that this is at. Yep, um, we will be working to open uh, child care in the regions that go yellow uh, so that people can go to work and know that their children are taken care of. There will be uh, challenges, uh, especially with young ones, um, with little ones, uh, in terms of infectious disease protection. And so I, I admit that that'll be a real challenge, but we know we'll have to open child care so people can go to work. Very cool. Okay, so any, any, listen, we have a um, lots of questions and we didn't have a chance to answer them all. And it is now running up into our time. So I will make sure that both of your offices get the list of these questions and then we will, we will put them out for everyone to share if that's okay. And Great. I cannot thank you both for the leadership that you have demonstrated during a very frenetic time and uh, ignoring all the Game of Thrones analogies here, just to <laughs> perk up some humor and to find some light in our day. I know that Secretary Levine, you are working, um, keeping our health and forefront and that matters and your leadership really matters to us. And in the tech community, we have been trying to build the ecosystem here in Southwestern Pennsylvania and beyond and we don't want to see it, it start to crumble. And uh, Dennis, you, you put your, you know, your money where your mouth is, and we really appreciate that and your leadership. And I know that Southwestern Pennsylvania is your home, so you might have a soft spot for us, which we love. But thank you both for your leadership. We will stay in touch with you. Hopefully you will continue to stay in touch with us. And we will, are now looking for 
Senator Casey, because he is somewhere here and we want to find him. Both of them. Hey, that's a request. Now, you would. 2005. To my knowledge, you guys have not signed. But you did. You did. Right. I right, right, did. I think it's a fair question at any point. Hello, this is Brian Kennedy from the Tech Council. Um, we're, Senator Casey is logging in right now um, and he'll be on in just a moment. Okay, I think we have Senator Casey on the line. Senator, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, so we have Senator Casey by audio. Senator Casey, this is your friend, Audrey Russo. So hopefully you can speak. Audrey, Audrey, it's great to hear your voice. Is that the other voice was Jonathan? That's me. It's Jonathan. Okay. Yes, so well, thank, thank you for taking the time with us. Really appreciate it. Sure, thank you. So can you hear us clearly? Because I'm going to start asking you some questions. I, you, I, you can, I can hear you, Audrey. And whenever I hear your voice, I stand at attention because you are someone who knows how to run a meeting. <laughs> Love it. Uh -oh. We're in trouble now. Man. I'm not, I'm, Audrey, I'm sitting down. I hope that's appropriate. Is that OK? OK, it's appropriate. You can sit down now. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Okay, just don't put your feet up. Just don't recline too much. <laughs> okay. So Congress has been working this week on a bipartisan basis to pass with what some are referring to as stimulus 3.5, but many people think the country is gonna need much more than that to pull out of the crisis. So what do you think might be part of package 4.0? Well, Audrey, thanks for the question. I do want to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity, and I want to thank each of you for what you're doing, both uh, in running companies at this difficult time, but also for what you're contributing to the, um, the, the city of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County in southwestern Pennsylvania. And I have no doubt that um, the work that you're all doing is going to help us dig out of this crisis. And I think for purposes of legislation, I, I just want to just quickly review where we've been. We've had four bills so far. And think about it this way. We've had and the first bill in early March was, it seems like 100 years ago now, an $8 billion bill. The second bill, the family's first bill, was uh, exceeded, I believe, $100 billion. And then, of course, the third bill was the big one, the 2.2 trillion dollar bill, the CARES Act. Just uh, the last 48 hours or so, we had the Senate and the House pass this uh, interim bill. And to further complicate things, they're calling it 3.5, because it was, a, it was meant to only address a couple of issues. Uh, number one, to get more dollars into the small business program, not, not only the Paycheck Protection Program, but, but also the economic injury disaster 
uh, program as well, but it also importantly made changes to the so-called PPP program because uh, there were a lot of folks left out in, in terms of where the dollars were going, in terms of um, um, the small businesses that were run by minorities or in places where you had a small number, or, or I should say businesses with a small number of employees. So we made changes to the program in addition to providing uh, more than 300 billion more for the program. So that's good. But importantly, in this interim bill, we got 25 billion for testing um, and, and 75 billion for hospitals, both of which were critically important. What was left out of this bill, and which is a major flaw or shortcoming of this interim bill, was a additional was additional funding for what we did in the CARES Act, the $2.2 trillion bill, for state and local governments. And I think that if, if you were starting with what could be done in the next bill or what should be done, I think we have to start there. Um, I, I think it was a terrible moment when Leader McConnell said that state and state governments should declare bankruptcy or seek bankruptcy protection if they're having trouble um, balancing their budgets. That that is um, not an answer for those communities and those states. Uh, it's it's a, a it's a I think an indication though about how difficult this next bill will be to negotiate because there is going to be substantial opposition to uh, supporting state and local governments beyond the the uh, 150 billion in the first um, in, in the third bill, the, the CARES Act. But th these these governments need help. And I know that some politicians in Washington want to make the case that, oh, if these governments are having trouble, it's because they they did this or that or they overspent. Well, if you're a politician who's saying you're not for support for state and local governments, then you're not for supporting public safety. Because most local communities, as you all know, when you talk about their budgets, it's often 70% or more of their budget is public safety, police and fire, and emergency services and, and spending like that. So if a politician says no more money for state and local governments, they should have to explain why they don't wanna support public safety, why they don't want to support police officers, why they don't want to support firefighters, and why they don't want to support basic public safety in their communities. If they can explain that, and they can say that, that uh, you know, the, the, the hole in these budgets had nothing to do with the virus, then if they can explain that, then maybe we should listen to them. Otherwise, we got to lobby hard to get more money for state and local governments. Now, let me tell you some of the things that I'm gonna be focused on. I'm gonna be focused on food assistance. We need more money for food assistance in a big way. We need more money to have a better food delivery system, especially for those who are seniors that are in uh, high rises or seniors that can't get to the grocery store. We do not have in the United States of America an adequate system for getting food to seniors and to vulnerable populations, including those with disabilities who are often trapped in their home and we're telling them, telling them to stay in their homes. They need, we, we need more money for that. I will be advocating strongly as well for more dollars for Medicaid. Uh, I just happen to be joined in that by governors of both parties across the country there will be resistance to all of these ideas I just outlined. Resistance to support for local and state government. Resistance and opposition to more money for Medicaid and opposition as well to food assistance. We should also, and I'm giving you my list here, but I'll, I'll stop at this. We also should pass a measure which appropriately recognizes the soldiers on the battlefield here. Uh, those, uh, those healthcare workers, uh, either in hospitals or nursing homes or home health settings, those first responders who are out there every day putting themselves at risk, as well as a hell of a lot of other workers, whether they're, doing, whether they're in sanitation or they're in grocery stores or in pharmacies and other places, uh, we need to recognize them by virtue of creating a hero's fund for pandemic premium payments. 
Uh, I have an additional idea that we should, for healthcare workers, for that group discreetly, we should focus on a G GI Bill-like support, uh, maybe a, an education or loan forgiveness initiative or or some other support that's additional for healthcare workers. So you can tell just by virtue of my list and my some of my priorities uh, how difficult it will be to negotiate the next bill. But we got a long way to go to meeting the, 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 the double challenge we have, stopping the spread of the virus and beginning to rebuild our economy and helping our workers and our families and small businesses. Still a lot of work to do, but we've got to do this as best we can in a bipartisan fashion. So we've had, we have a bunch of questions and I want to ask Jonathan to see if he can pull out a couple of questions to ask you. Jonathan. Absolutely. I think the biggest concerns we're seeing right now from our, our chat are really around really small businesses being able to access money and funds. You know, a lot of it has dried up and people are having a hard time um, applying right now. Any sorts of advice or, or resources heading their way that they can be uh, looking forward to? Well, first I'd say um, for, for those who are have, have been applying, especially very small businesses, uh, these new changes that uh, should be law as soon as the president signs the bill uh, should help. If you're a smaller business, these changes should help you. Look, I, I understand that the federal government has, gosh, maybe 30 or 35 different definitions of small business, and one of them is 500 or less. So that's that's what the that's where the cutoff was. But but the the help so far has gone to those 300, 400 uh, type um, small businesses. We need help for, for minority owned small businesses. We need help for mom and pop operations that employ five, employ five people or seven people or eight people. And these changes should help with that and should help by getting dollars to the so-called CDFIs, the community development financial entities and communities. Um, I would say this, if you have a, if your particular small business uh, needs help accessing uh, the SBA or, or getting more information, I'd, I'd leave you two numbers. One would be, or, or two bits of information in terms of how we can help. Number one is our constituent services uh, operation. Our office wants to help if we can. And I'll give you that number. It's, it's, it's a number that uh, obviously is available no matter what time of the year or what the crisis right. is, but it's especially important now. One, that's an 866 number, 866-461-9159. That's our Senate uh, Constituent Services Office, 866-461-9159. The other thing I'd say is on our website, uh, kc.senate.gov, we have information about all these different programs and different subject areas under a whole new section, a coronavirus section. That has links uh, to uh, government agencies uh, whether it's a small business or whether it's at the state level for unemployment compensation uh, or the like. So if we can help that way, we, we will try to be as, as supportive as we can be. But it is up to the, uh, the, the federal government, the executive branch, and in particular SBA, to get you the help that you need if you're a small business. We can try to intervene as best we can and try to try to answer your questions. But I really hope that these new changes, in addition to the new dollars, uh, are going to help a lot more folks. Okay, so um, Jonathan. Yes. There are some good questions out there. They are rolling in, and I absolutely love it. So um, here's a quick one from uh, Jim Penna. Um, what are your thoughts on the communication and education challenges we have faced uh, during this crisis? Well, those challenges are substantial, and we're, we're, we're hearing an awful lot about this. Even though we can point with, um, we, we can say that the, uh, uh, the CARES Act provided for Pennsylvania something on the order of about $625 million for um, education uh, support, and that a lot of those dollars should be used at, a, at um, not just the state level, but at the school district level for technology to, to be able to provide distance learning opportunities. But l let's be blunt about this. We are, 
uh, we are, are badly uh, limited in, in a state that has a lot of rural communities by the lack of uh, broadband deployment across the state. We, we have still a major problem in rural Pennsylvania and in small towns in Pennsylvania as well as rural America because we don't have nearly enough uh, connectivity in a lot of communities. We've got 67 counties, 48 of them are rural. Um, and people, my staff is sick of me saying this, but I, I say it every three days, I think, because rural Pennsylvania has all kinds of disadvantages. And one of them is uh, kids uh, in schools uh, don't, often are not connected. And, and kids at home, obviously, will not be connected as well. So we need to think, uh, and, and I know with a lot of smart uh, tech folks on this call, we need to think way out of the box about how you get, uh, how you provide that kind of connectivity uh, because you can't, you, we can't just rely upon school districts to create their own networks uh, on the fly here. We need help from the private sector um, and, and from, from government itself to make sure that we can provide ways for children to learn because so many schools, as you know, are not going to be back in class this year. And even in the fall, we're going to face substantial challenges. So this is a major uh, challenge that, that Jim asked in his question, and I know he's one of the folks who can help us figure it out, but we've got, we've got a long way to go on this. Jonathan, there's still more questions and we have some time. Yeah, here's a really pertinent one, really um, looking at how we can make sure that our 501c6 chambers of commerce can be supported during this. Currently, they, they can't apply for many of, of these funds, but will be really necessary towards disseminating information and helping businesses get back up and running. Is there any way we can look at ways of helping those types of organizations through this? Well, I know Jack, Jack Rourke is on this call, or is listening on the call, and he's been tracking a lot of the, the small business issues uh, for our office, and I hope we can um, be responsive. But there's no reason why uh, a chamber uh, operation in a particular town in our state can't uh, benefit from this, uh, these small business initiatives as well as maybe other programs. So if there are, um, if there are ways that we can help, we, we, look, the, the, the program is designed to help uh, all kinds of small businesses, uh, not just small businesses by way of the, the um, employee count, uh, but but uh, gig gig workers. It's, it's designed to help folks who have been employed for a short period of time. It's designed to help independent contractors. So we, we, if if there's a way to to have your folks connect with ours uh, or to have uh, the questioner connect with ours uh, on ways we can break through if there are impediments right now. But this, you know, we we, sh we just appropriated when you. When you look at the two bills, CARES and this interim bill, uh, it was it was 350 in the first, and and it's well over 300 billion in this. And there's no reason why you're we're spending six or seven hundred billion dollars, and a local chamber can't get help. That makes no sense, and that's not what the legislative intent was. Okay, great, Jonathan. One more question. Absolutely. Like I said, I'm so impressed with our questions from our crowd here today. So as we've all seen the importance of internet access to businesses and especially to students, is there any thoughts about making internet access basically, you know, like, like, like a right for all to have, to make it more like a utility that we've got to have it? I, I am open to any ideas and you're, the folks on this call uh, have much greater technical expertise than I to be able to, uh, to make that case. Uh, this, th this, this problem uh, goes across uh, all kinds of lines, but it is especially acute in, in small towns and rural areas. It is an education equity issue. Just like I have made the case and will continue to make the case that kids in our inner cities get, get the short end of the stick when it comes to education funding uh, all the time in virtually every state, uh, that's an education equity issue. In rural areas, this is a different kind of education uh, equity issue. It, it became most clear to me 
when I was a couple of years ago, more, more like four years ago now, I was on the phone with uh, a, a group of commissioners in southwestern Pennsylvania. We were talking about broadband, and I was talking about businesses being adversely impacted. And the commissioner screamed into the conference in, into the conference call. He said, "Senators, kids can't do their homework." He just screamed it like that. They can't do their homework. And that's when it became clear to me that this is an education equity issue. So any ideas that, that folks have in any ways that we can address this um, in the next bill, we have to do that because whatever we've done out there, funding for broadband in the, uh, in the farm bill and in agricultural programs, funding through the FCC, uh, this this kind of funding, that kind of funding, it is not working, folks. We are not deploying enough broadband, and this crisis has shined a spotlight on that that societal problem. These kids are being held back because of where they live, because of the, them they're living in a small town or rural area in Pennsylvania and across the country, and it's made ever more grave a problem ever more severe and urgent a problem because of the, the virus. So I am open to any new idea, any way to fast track deployment, any way to make, uh, provide connectivity, even, even in the short run, even in the next couple of months, because these kids have to learn, especially now. So another question, Jonathan? Let's keep them rolling here. Um, let me see here as we, as we scroll through the list. They're all jamming up in our chat room here. Um, let me see here. A lot of these are actually people making comments about how that there is some local activity going on here. Um, let me see here. So we talked about the 501c6. I'm still scrolling here, Audrey, and I'm struggling to pull. Okay, well, let me jump in. Real yeah, quick get it. While you're looking. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that we're suggesting the second surge of infections might be on the horizon. So, what do you think the priorities should be? So at the federal and the private sector. Well, look, I, there's a, there's a, yeah, Audrey, this, you, you, you know better than I, the, the urgency for uh, folks out there to open up, to get, to try to get back to some semblance of normalcy and, and um, uh, folks, I think, know that there are lots of ways to do that appropriately and, and with strict adherence to the public health uh, guidance and expertise that's out there. Um, and I just think we have to be guided by the expertise, not guided by some arbitrary um, deadlines that that, uh, that folks put out there, not guided by some theory that a politician has. Or I, I think we, we, we should, as best we can, um, you know, if, if you want to put it in a hashtag, it would be Listen to Fauci. And when I say Fauci, I'm not talking about just Dr. Fauci. I'm talking about the public health expertise that's out there, whether it's Fauci or Burks or others in the White House Advisory Task Force, or whether it's Dr. Levine and the other experts she consults with to advise Governor Wolf, or whether it's someone at, um, at, at uh, one of the great um, education or research in institutions in southwestern Pennsylvania, um, as well. We have so much expertise out there that we have to place heavily, heavy reliance upon to be guided by uh, so that we, we open up appropriately. And I think that we should assume when someone like Fauci says they have no doubt, no doubt that there'll be a problem in the fall, let's put that in the bank. Let's not debate it or scratch our heads about it. There's going to be a problem in the fall. Let's get ready for it. Let's not have this this uh, problem that we've had as a nation where we, we get hit with the thing on the side of our head and we ramp up and have to create the, the defense for it or, or the strategy for it. We need to be at a war footing every day. And this idea that the United States of America would have the colossal failures on testing and personal protective equipment that we have had is, is really an insult to everybody on this phone call and everybody you know. This is the United States of America. We should make sure that no matter what, we have the testing capacity, we have the personal protective equipment capacity, we have all the capacity we need uh, to, to confront this virus, whether it's this summer again or this fall 
or 50 years from now. This idea that we ramp up is crazy. We should have a brand new industrial policy so that there is never a question ever again that we have the personal protective equipment that we need. My God, the city of Pittsburgh in World War I, 100 years ago, provided 80% of all the steel used by the U.S. Army. That helped us win World War I. There were 250 war plants in the city of Pittsburgh employing a half a million people seven days a week. That's how you win a war. You do whatever it takes. You, you do whatever it, it takes in the private sector, the public sector, the government sector, and otherwise. That's how you win a war. We have to be ready for this war in the fall, in the summer, a year from now, five years from now, 50 years from now. We were not ready. We were caught flat-footed, and we cannot allow that to happen again. Thank you. Thank you for that. One more question, because you've covered a lot of the things that I was going to ask you. So one more question, Jonathan. Yeah, so Priya Amin has a great question here, Audrey, and she wants to know what government is doing to support working parents with school-age kids while schools remain closed now through the rest of the school year, maybe into next school year. Well, I think the short answer is not enough. That's, that's if I can be as direct as that. Look, there was, there were, let me say good things though about the some of the work that's been done already the the family's first legislation that was bill number two as well as bill number three the big cares act uh, spoke to a lot of these needs not not nearly enough but it but it did for example in cares uh, there's about three and a half billion dollars in child care development and development block grants that goes directly to families pennsylvania got about 105 million of that that's good but we need more uh, the, the education dollars I mentioned earlier were, were helpful as well. But we need to, to per, we need to make sure, and we've called for this, but the Labor Department hasn't wanted to do it. We need a, a temporary emergency, or an emergency temporary, I should say, standard for workers. So if you're a worker, but you've got kids at home and you've got a child care issue, you, we need to make sure that that worker is supported if, she, if, if he or she needs to uh, make a change in their their work schedule or their work life. We need to be nimble and adaptive uh, to the needs of these families. We have to help families with with uh, uh, food assistance as well, so that if a a child is getting a school meal, as they are not just in big cities but a lot of small towns, that we're helping them with that as well. We need to make sure that we're providing as much in the way of health care options as we can. You know, a, a lot of people think that Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program are about for city kids and urban kids. The fact of the matter is there are more kids in rural America who get their health care through Medicaid and CHIP as a percent of a, a much higher percentage than urban kids. So we need to be focused on making sure that there are health care options available if a family doesn't have coverage or if the child isn't covered or if there isn't support for those, uh, for those children. And, I, and I'd say this as well, if someone come, is, if, if, a, if, if an American uh, is diagnosed with COVID-19, they shouldn't pay a goddamn dime for the treatment. That treatment should be, yes, free, free. This is America, we can do it. The idea that the federal government said your test is free, that's great, but that doesn't do much for you if you need treatment. So if a family gets hit over the head with coronavirus, the treatment for that individual in that family, whether it's a child, an adult of any age, it should be free. But we have to do more to meet the needs of these families. Child care is important, education support, food assistance, and so many other uh, supports. So we're going to continue to take in ideas for this next bill, and um, anyone out there who has suggestions, we're open to it. Senator Casey, I can't thank you enough on Great. behalf of the entire community for the work that you're doing and for the time that you've taken with us. And you know I was gentle on you today, but there are a bunch <laughs> of questions that um, will be asked and you didn't get a chance to, so we will um, work on those offline. And we archive this and we'll keep this on our website and we'll get some answers to questions, including the resources that you articulate and point people to. 
So hey, thank, Audrey, you. Thank, thank you. Can I just say thanks? And we'll try to we'll try to have those questions uh, answered if if you can transmit them to us. Yeah. I, I do want to thank you for the the opportunity. I, I want to say to your your membership who's listening that uh, look, I, I know I know a good bit about the history of southwestern Pennsylvania and, and Pittsburgh and as a as a city and as a as a larger region. And the only way that uh, that whole region has begun to come back is because uh, people like those on this call mm -hmm. knew that you had to invent your own future. Right. And I have no doubt that even as you're helping uh, to stabilize the economy of southwestern Pennsylvania, that you will help us invent a better future for the, the country as, in terms of how we respond to this crisis. So I want to thank you for the, the knowledge and the know-how and the innovation, innovative thinking that will allow us to get through this. So thank you and God bless your work. Thank you. Thank you and very I'd like much. to thank AT&T and Huntington Bank for believing in us and being sponsors. And then everyone have a great weekend, but we're back on Monday. We actually have already have a packed week next week. Monday, we're kicking it off with OSHA Administrator Lauren Sweet. And we also will have the president of Carnegie Mellon and the leader of Phillips Respironics for Southwestern Pennsylvania. So we'll see you all then. Be safe and thanks again. Thank you.